I've been living in Cuba since March of 2010, studying at the Latin American School of Medicine in Havana. You disconnect from most of your technology, and you begin dealing with people on a personal basis, face to face. Um, everything that you have to do on your laundry list of daily chores, um, you have to cut that down maybe a, a fifth or a tenth here because we don't have cars, we rely on public transportation, or even when it's close to walk to somewhere, we have to go through quite a bit of, uh, there's lines and hassle and especially the language difference. So I think Cubans say being in Cuba can be difficult at times. Being a foreigner, um, even though we have more money, it doesn't always mean that it's super easy either. But we have a lot of fun. People are very open, people are really warm. You can talk to anybody on the streets and that makes anything easier. My impression is that almost every microcosm, every clique, every group of 20-somethings that exists in the U.S., to some level or another exists here in Cuba. I think the cultures are so synonymous in that that even though there has been this difference and sort of this backlog of globalization in Cuba uh, compared to the United States, through the culture that we have exchanged, there are people who are into anime or people who are into computer programming or people who are into riding or skateboarding or swimming. I mean, there's all, all these small cliques that exist, the, rock, the rockers, the punks, the goths, the, the, the Mickey girls, the really cheek looking people. I mean, they're all there. And so that's something that maybe, I don't know if any other Cuban generation has had for a long time. No, definitely not. Not all. Um, it's something everyone talks about. That needs to be recognized. I've never lived in a society where everyone talks about the option of leaving. But the fact that everyone has the option to leave, one way or another, one way or another, not always legally, not always above board, but they talk about entertaining the option to leave, says something about the society. Because to want to leave, you have to know what's out there, or at least have an idea of it, and believe enough in yourself that you can use something to succeed outside. And so to create a society where so many people feel that way is pretty incredible. Um, I think that what makes people realize those things but then choose to stay are numerous factors like you said but things that I've heard people tell me is sometimes it's family reasons sometimes they believe that they will be able to get on the ground floor and um, you know things are going to get better pretty soon like they just double doctor's salary okay well I'll stick it out maybe they'll double my salary soon sometimes people feel like they've invested a lot of time in their education and they said, no, I've been educated here, I know the culture here, I know what I need to do to keep moving up in my profession, so I'll, I'll stay. Um, sometimes they, they really love being here. Some people have a deep connection with the island and just the palm trees and being close to the ocean. I've met people who've come back who've told me stuff like that, just the geography attracts them back. So there's lots of reasons why people stay. Whatever happens, um, it's probably gonna happen slowly. I think that's pretty a given. And when I say slowly, I'm not trying to imply a negative or positive correlation there. I'm trying to say compared to the rate of change that the rest of the world has experienced and some people want the rest of the world to experience. So I think there's going to be, as far as commerce goes, much more foreign exchange with money, much more foreign exchange with people. Um, not foreign exchange via solidarity brigades, but probably much more tourism. Tourism is a market that's doubled in the past four or five years and will probably continue to do so for the next 10 or 20 years. I think there's going to be a lot more people coming here for education, but not education as previously under what I came. So it's sort of like this free education, but Cuba's realized it's human resources is also a very good source of income. And so lots of people are now paying to go to school here, paying to you know, specialize in um, the medical field or um, uh, engineering, mathematics, um, some of those higher level uh, courses that maybe aren't offered in all developing countries. Um, so that's definitely going to bring about change. You know, that, it, that those dual factors of people coming here staying long term and people coming here staying short term as tourists. And that's probably going to propel the cultural change more than any single policy the government will put into place or change, I believe. I mean, you can keep grandma newspaper for the next 50 years saying what it says today and this country will go on changing. That's no longer the main controlling force. No, the blockade should have been abandoned a long time ago. Totally missed, dropped the ball when Jimmy Carter 
tried to open the intersection to do what Obama's doing now. Basically, Obama's implementing a policy that Jimmy Carter started in 1977. This shouldn't be new to anybody. This is not a new opening. This is what Jimmy Carter wanted to do in 1977, and he didn't get to do it because he wasn't elected a second term and didn't use his first term to his full ability, is what I see it as. And so, yeah, too bad. Too bad we, um, we, we played out the Cold War uh, frivolously for so long. So I think uh, the embargo, the blockade, definitely needs to be ended, whatever you want to call it. Um, that those 25, 24 different laws governing how people are allowed to interact with Cuba is fundamentally not aligned with what we believe as Americans. The freedom to travel. What? That's ridiculous. I can't go to a country 90 miles away from our shores. And I'm an American citizen with a passport. Paid $100 for it. It's ridiculous. Yeah, needs to change. <laughs>